Okay. Well, this morning, we're starting our new series. Uh, it's actually going to take us right way through to Advent. It's a slightly ambitious series we're calling The Dictionary. Uh, and the aim we have through this series is that I want to provide us with, a functional, with functional definitions of some important Christian words that we use in church all the time. Now, as I said, this is a bit of an ambitious aim, and there are a number of ways it could go wrong. We're going to be covering some really important topics, and although there's going to be a lot of overlap between those topics, obviously there's going to be so much more that could be said every week. That's one of the the difficulties we have when doing a topical series, and it's one of the reasons why we don't do them very often. In fact, I think um, we've maybe done only two in the past four years, uh, something like that, and because um, they, they, they're really difficult to do. Any given topic, there's almost an infinite number of ways we could approach it, things we could say about it. And the reality is that with a topical ser- series, each week there's going to be so- one of us thinking, I wish he'd said more about that thing. And so the first thing that we can do together to make this a good series is to set our expectations. We're dealing with some really big ideas and there's no way I can say everything that there is to say. And so it's going to require at least two things from you. First of all, you need to trust me. I'm asking you to trust me, that you trust that I'm being sincere, that, that I'm being diligent, that I am, I am studying this stuff and I'm deep in it every week. But above all, trust me that I love you. I do. Trust me that I'm not preaching out of ego, I'm not preaching out of intrigue, not just to kind of tickle our minds and make us think, but out of love. Because I want us to have the tools to have fruitful conversations full of Jesus. I specifically ask for trust because I just, I can't show you all of my working out every week, as it were. None of us are served well if I have to preach in a defensive way, constantly feeling like I have to back up every little assertion that I make and show you where everything is established in scripture because we won't get very far if we have to do it that way. Obviously, I'm going to do some of that. In fact, we'll do a lot of that, but it'll never be enough to satisfy everyone's curiosity all of the time. And so, I'm asking you to trust me that I'm not just making stuff up. But this brings us to the second thing you can do, and that's ask questions. Ask questions. I'm asking you to trust me, but that doesn't mean silently just nodding your head and withdrawing and just going, well, I don't agree with that, but I guess I just have to trust him. No. If you're struggling with one of, the, one of the definitions or something, I say, come and talk to me about it. Ask me, where is this from? Where have you got that? I didn't understand how you pieced all that together. Whatever it may be. If you can agree to do those two things, to trust me and follow up when you have questions, that really helps me. Because it frees me up to preach, knowing that you will follow up on anything that's unclear. And it means that I don't have to just cover stuff just in case. To be honest, that's how it should always be, right? That's how it should always be. Because actually, I love nothing more than hearing from you when you have something to follow up on from the sermon. Because it means you're listening, it means you're engaged, it means you're thinking, and I love that. So, it's a slightly ambitious series. Why are we doing it? The great need for this series is that we are so often kind of talking across each other. We're talking across purposes. Not just in Hope Church, but across the church. There are so many um, denominations and groups in the Western church. There There are so many different ideas out there about what words mean, even if they are only very nuanced differences, there is still a difference. And so this can easily lead to confusion with us talking with each other, talking at cross purposes. I think you mean one thing, you think I mean another, and it becomes a very frustrating conversation where everyone kind of gets wound up, 
and there's not a lot of um, heat, uh, light produced. Take the word evangelical, just as an example. What does it mean to be an evangelical? I reckon, we're not going to do this, it would be interesting though, if we went round this room and I asked you all on a piece of paper to write, what is an evangelical? There would, we would get several different answers. There would be nobody who would have word for word the same as anybody else, for sure. And there'd be, we'd have different, if not completely different answers, we'd have different emphasis on our answers. If someone asks me if I'm an evangelical, most often I say, well, what do you mean by that? Because it, it really depends on the person who's asking. If you mean this, yes, I'm an evangelical. If you mean that, that's not, I don't think that's an evangelical, I, I'm not that, yeah? Do you see? And so what we need is a dictionary. And what I would like to do at the end of this series is to provide us all with a little printout with all the words we're going to cover and their definition uh, for each word so that even if we don't all necessarily agree with those definitions, we at least know when Doug speaks from here, that is what he means. Having said all that, this series is not about writing the dictionary or inventing the dictionary. My aim is not to give you my ideas about what these words mean. The aim isn't to have a dictionary of, well, you know, this is what we individually as Hope Church have decided to, this is how we've decided to understand these words and use them. No. What we want to do is find out what God means when he uses these words. So how can we know what God means? Well, we might say, just read the Bible and see what he means. And that's, that's right, isn't it? But there is a problem that we need to at least acknowledge. Not a problem with the Bible, a problem with me and a problem with you. Well, a problem with us, humanity. You see, when two sincere Christians who have slightly different ideas about a word, a doctrine, or a biblical teaching, when they are talking about it, they will both say that they are simply saying what the Bible says. But I hope we can agree that God can't mean, he can't mean two conflicting things. And yet both parties will pull up verses from scripture to support their point and oftentimes make very compelling arguments. How can we understand this? The only conclusion we can come to is one or both of us, both of them, is not understanding correctly what God meant by that verse, by that word, by that idea. You see, as well as talking at cross purposes with each other, we can also be talking at cross purposes with God. We can pluck out a verse of scripture that supports our, our you know, ta-da, look, it says this. But is that what God meant by that verse, that word, or that idea? And so, so what can we do? How do we get around this? How do we sort this out? How can we understand what God means? Well... Where has God been speaking? Who has he entrusted his truth to? The church. His church. We'll think a lot about this in the coming weeks, particularly as we do church and Bible and, and we go on. We'll think much about this because so much of this can be interconnected. But it's the church that God has entrusted with the truth. That's why Paul calls it in 1 Timothy 3.15, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Just to say, if you look that up later on in your ESV, it says a pillar. It's the pillar. It's a translation issue in that text. It's the pillar and foundation of the truth is the church. The church is where we hear God speaking. It is where he has promised to keep safe the truth. 
And so that is where we go when we want to understand God. We saw this at the end of 2 Peter, didn't we? God has spoken through prophets and apostles carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the prophets and the apostles have died, but their teaching has continued. Carried along by the Holy Spirit through the church. And what I'm getting at here is that these definitions are not my idea. This is not a series of what I think these words mean. As with all of my preaching and my teaching, I'm not sharing my opinions. I read and I study and I pray and I listen. I'm trying to find the best understanding of what the church has believed through all time and in all places. What does that mean, finding what the church has believed across all time and in all places? It doesn't mean that every single individual Christian who has ever lived agreed with all of this. It also doesn't mean you won't be able to go back to the fathers and find someone who will disagree with what I'm going to say. It is possible to go into the history of the church and find someone who will agree with almost any position. And you can find somebody to back almost any idea. But that isn't what we're interested in. We're not interested in finding any individual, any one man who who says something. Or any one group who thought a certain way. We are interested in what the church as a whole has believed. So we can't just go back into history, find someone who holds a particular position, pluck them out, hold them up and say, look, my view is legitimate. For example... Uh, We recently mentioned a man called Arius, do you remember? Arius was a heretic, a divisive person teaching things that weren't true. And we all agree on that thing, nobody questions that. Well, maybe a few cults, but nobody questions that Arius was a heretic. We all reject his teaching. Why? Because that's what the church decided. Arius came out with his ideas, the church actually got together collectively and rejected it. There are ideas that have been held by individuals and that have even accumulated a movement for a while, but that have been rejected by the church as a whole. And this is good news. Because it means we don't need to start from scratch in every generation. We don't have to open our Bible. Well, I don't know what it means. Let's work it out. It's like, no, there's this history of meaning and truth that the Lord has kept through his church. In the same way, we are not trying to define these words afresh. We're simply looking for how the church has always understood these terms. Now, the very idea of that is hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to imagine that there was ever a time when the whole church agreed on things. Because we live in a time where many Christians even struggle to define what the church is, where it can be found, and why it matters. But there was a time when there was the church, following the teaching of the apostles. Now, of course, it didn't take long for that to fragment in some way. That's why the councils were necessary. Because people were fragmenting the church heretics like Arius and others. But the very action of these councils in the first few hundred years shows us that there was a belief that there was a single movement of the Spirit in the church. They believed that the Holy Spirit was not confused. That he wasn't telling one person over here this thing and another person over there that thing. And I think today we far too quickly and easily accept the idea that the Holy Spirit is confused. That he must be telling different people different things. But the early church did not accept that so easily. They were fighting for the faith that was handed down to them. As we have been seeing in Peter and Jude. And I think sometimes out of godly motives... And out of an attempt to reach unity, we are too quick to agree to disagree. 
And so we are simply looking for how the ancient church defined these words. Before there were major splits and lots of new ideas, that's what we're reaching for in this series. We might not quite grab it, but that's what we're reaching for. We are not on a path to become any particular thing. We are simply on a path seeking the truth, seeking wisdom and understanding, desperately wanting to be part of the thing that Jesus started, acknowledging that there is something bigger than us, something bigger than our own understanding, and that we don't have the answers all by ourselves. Our aim here is not to give our ideas or definitions. Instead, we want to root ourselves in what was going on in the very beginning in the church that Jesus started. With all that said, by way of introduction to our series, where do we start? What is our first word? Well, our first word is the word, the eternal word, Jesus. We begin with him. Because in reality, our first word, Jesus, is actually outside our dictionary. As we mentioned before, to give something a definition means to define it, to draw a line around it and say, this is where it begins, this is what it, where it ends, this is what it is. But what did Jesus say? He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Yeah? This is the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. He's saying, I'm the, and he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus revealed himself to us. He joined us in our humanity. He took on human flesh. And yet, he was always the eternal word of God. The beginning and the end. We can't define him. We can confess truths about him. But we cannot say everything true about him. We, cannot, we can't say this is what he means. Because he is meaning. Jesus is meaning. He is the first word of this series, not because he's the first word in our dictionary, but because he defines every other word in our dictionary. Jesus gives meaning to every word in our dictionary. We cannot understand the other words without beginning with him. He said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. We have to start with him. Because he is the beginning. And when we come to the end, he will still be there. The purpose of words is to communicate meaning. To take an idea or a thought that is in one place, let's say for example my head right now, I have thoughts in my head, and I want to give them a vehicle to carry that thought into your head. Words do that. But there is a limitation to words. Words are by nature reductionistic. They reduce things so that they can be transported. So if I talk about a tree, if I say the word tree right now, you're all thinking of a tree. Yeah? You might even be thinking about the word tree or the concept of tree. You might not even be envisaging it, but you're thinking of a tree. And this is the point. You are probably not picturing the same thing as me or anybody else in this room. I might be thinking about a specific moment under a specific tree. I can remember the smell of the blossom, the, the earth under my feet, the dappled light coming through the leaves. I'm experiencing that again as I think about this tree. But simply the word tree does not convey all of that meaning to you, does it? And so we need to use more words. Sometimes we need to use many words to, do, to try and describe something that the experience of was so simple and brief. And yet we struggle to find words that convey what that moment was like. I think we all know that experience. Trying to find words to, to explain what we feel or to tell others what it was like. And it's frustrating, isn't it? Because words can never fully convey meaning. This is one of the reasons why images are so important in Christianity. 
The same, as the saying goes, a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. That is true, isn't it? We tie ourselves in knots trying to explain something that an image can convey almost instantly. An image, a, a picture, a painting, it can move us. It can cause us to feel something. It can transport us to another time and space. As modern Western people who think very diagnostically, we always try and reduce things to language. It's one of the reasons we struggle with a lot of Christian art and a lot of Christian iconography. Because we see a beautiful icon and we immediately go, I wonder what that means. And our instinct is to reduce it to words. And Well, this represents that and this represents the church and this represents this. But even if we were able to write up a thorough description of an icon, of a Christian image, explaining all the characters and all the pieces, vividly describing the shapes and the, and the, and the colours, you know, we could write an essay on it. Even if we could do that, you would never replicate the experience of just standing in front of it and taking it in. Letting it preach to you. Letting it bring truth and beauty and mystery before you. Words are a tool to communicate. They are an important tool. One we must master. But we must also recognise their limitations. So words don't just... The point is, words don't just exist for the sake of words, do they? They exist to communicate something. Their whole purpose is to communicate a reality. The words are not the reality. They're communicating something bigger. Even if they do that in a reduced or imperfect way, they are vehicles for meaning. The question is, what is the ultimate meaning that they are to convey? What is the ultimate purpose of words? What is the meaning that is worth communicating? What is it that lies at the center of everything? What is it that makes the universe tick, that gives everything substance and beauty and meaning? The answer that the Bible gives us is not a what, but a who, Jesus. So we read that bit in Exodus 24 when Moses goes up the mountain. This happens after the Exodus. God calls Moses up the mountain and he gives him the Ten Commandments written on stone tablets. It's maybe an image that, as I say it to you, you're familiar with, you're thinking about it, you're imagining it. But what exactly happened when Moses went up the mountain? Well, for a start, of course, the one who Moses met face to face with was Jesus. The same person who met him in the burning bush and the same person who was leading them in the fiery, cloudy pillar. And we can have this image, can't we, um, of like Jesus sat at a workbench with a chisel and a hammer. Moses comes up and he's like just chiseling out, tapping out the Ten Commandments. Here you go, Moses. Take them down to the people. Be careful not to break them. But there's a whole lot more going on on top of the mountain than that. We get a little glimpse of it in Stephen's preaching in Acts chapter 7. Right before he's martyred, right before he's killed, Stephen is preaching and he speaks of the law as delivered by angels. The law as delivered by angels. And we're like, hang on a minute. No, 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 no. Moses got them from Jesus. Right? On the mountain. What do you mean delivered by angels? Well, this is just a small clue as to what Moses saw up on the mountain. It wasn't just Jesus all by himself. You see, the God of the Old Testament is not some lonely bearded man sitting on a mountain waiting for someone to come and visit him. He is the epicenter of reality. All life, matter and truth radiates out from him. He constantly sustains all that exists. Light and life pulse from him. The angels constantly surround him and there are constant chants of praise and he's seated on his wheeled throne that moves around the cosmos with his divine counsel. Where he is, 
heaven is found. It is a hive of life and light and activity. And so when Moses ascended the mountain, we saw a glimpse of it. The elders saw a glimpse of this sapphire pavement. He was ascending into heaven, into the heavenly throne room, into the center of the cosmos. Moses ascends the mountain. He comes into the garden of God at the top of the mountain and he enters into the tent in which God dwells with the divine council. Don't think of the tent you take camping with you. Think of a canopy of, of, of just this covering where he dwells, where he's surrounded by the divine council, surrounded by angelic beings, and Moses speaks to him face to face. It's no wonder Moses came down glowing, right? God writes the Ten Commandments on the, on the tablets of stone, not with a chisel, but with his own finger. And then these are delivered to Moses by the angels. These intermediaries that come to Moses. And they take the tablets from God and they deliver them to Moses. But Moses didn't just get the Ten Commandments on the mountain. God also gives Moses the instructions for the tabernacle. We skipped over them and we read because they're very long. But he gave him instructions for the tabernacle, this tent, and all the furniture that was to go into it. Well, what was the, ta what was the tabernacle? Well, simply, the tabernacle was essentially a portable temple. It was the place that God dwelled with his people. And as they were going through the wilderness, they'd pack it down, move it, build it up, and God would dwell there. It was a tent with special furniture in it. And God gave very spe specific instructions about how it was to be built and used. So God gave Moses the instructions of how to build it and what to put in it and how it all works. And then he says, as we read at the end of chapter 25, and see that you make them, that you make all of these things after the pattern for them. What's the pattern for them? That has been shown to you on the mountain. So the purpose of the tabernacle was that it was this model of the heavenly reality. When Moses built it, he was building a model of what he had seen in heaven. Paul makes this point in Hebrews. Writing about the priests and the feasts and the tabernacle, Paul says they serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. And so the tabernacle is this thing that is full of meaning. We've gone into some detail about the tabernacle before, but very simply we have these three pieces of furniture which represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have some furniture that represents the church. We have an area that represents the world, an area that represents all the creation. In the sacrifices and feasts that were given on the mountain, we have God's justice and love and mercy and atonement and forgiveness of sins and the defeat of the devil. The tabernacle was dripping with meaning. Because in this image, this icon, it was an icon of the heavenly reality. To see it in action, to have experienced it and smelt it and heard it, would have conveyed so much more meaning than we could ever give in words describing it. It was a model of the universe, the heavens and the earth, the meeting of the seen and unseen. Why are we talking about this now? What has this got to do with words and meaning and our dictionary? Well, because once they built the tabernacle and laid out the furniture, the altar, the lampstand, the table, uh, the, the ark, once they'd done all that, it was just a tent with furniture. And it had a list of feasts and things that were meant to be done. But it didn't function by itself. It needed someone to make it all work. It needed someone to make it make sense. It needed someone to go into the Holy of Holies, to light the incense, to put bread on the table, to light the lamps, to stoke the fires, to bring the people into the courtyard, to wash everything, to administer the sacrifices, to sprinkle the blood. Needed someone to make it all make sense, 
to make it all work. That person was the high priest. Take him out and it doesn't make sense. There is no meaning. It's just an odd tent in the desert. The tabernacle was designed around the high priest. It's where he was at work. At the center of the life of the tabernacle, this model of the universe, at the center of everything that happens, is this person, this figure, the high priest. Without him, it was just an empty tent with no meaning and no life. So, if the tabernacle is this picture of reality in the cosmos, this icon, if it is a copy of what Moses saw when he was up on the mountain, who is this high priest an icon of, an image of? Jesus! He is an image of Jesus. That is what Moses saw when he saw into the heavenly reality. He saw Jesus at the center of everything. He saw Jesus at the center of all reality, filling everything with meaning, making everything work. Interceding for people, sustaining everything, bringing life. And I think it is telling, and I think it is important, that the first thing Jesus gave the church was a model, was an image, was an icon. Because the, before the first words of scripture were ever written, Jesus gave the church a tabernacle. He showed the church, this is what I am doing. He invited them into it to experience heaven and to participate, not just hear about it, but to participate. Jesus was showing us, this is what reality is. It is me, Jesus, at the center of the world, I am the one who holds everything together. I am the one who fills everything with life. I am the one who gives meaning to everything. And so all of our words follow that. All of our words are trying to bring us into that reality. To him, to Jesus, to an understanding of the universe and everything that has Jesus at the center. Words have been given to us to communicate Jesus. He is the purpose of words. He is why they exist. And so all of our words must be in service to that goal. To knowing Jesus, to revealing Jesus, to participating in Jesus. And yet all of our words will fail in this task. Or certainly achieve it imperfectly. That is why what we will see through this series is that words are important, but words are not everything. Jesus is. Jesus is everything. And so we want to know him. We want to experience him. But that will not be done chiefly through a particular set of words, or through a sermon, or through being convinced of any particular idea. It will come through participating with Jesus by his Spirit. Our words will struggle to communicate the divine. But Jesus is the divine word who communicates himself to us. John's Gospel begins with these words. In the beginning was the word, Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He is the only word we tru truly seek to know. He is the reality that all of the words in our series are trying to explain and communicate. And so, of course, everything that we're going to talk about begins and ends with Jesus. We're going to look at church next week. Church is the people gathered around Jesus. Bible is the book about Jesus. Worship is a meal with Jesus. Sin is rebelling against Jesus. Faith is cooperation with Jesus. Baptism is saved and washed by Jesus. Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus. 
Liturgy, the life of Jesus. Treasure, the presence of Jesus. Rest, at home with Jesus. Prayer and Bible study, conversations with Jesus. Orthodox, the way of Jesus. This is our dictionary. All glory be to Jesus. Amen.